Um, so I'll be presenting uh, a more technical talk about Impala today. If any of you have seen uh, the presentation at Hadoop World, this is not the same presentation, so you don't have to leave right now. So this is more technical, less uh, marketing oriented. A um, <clears throat> little overview, why did we do Impala? The goal was to get a, um, to have a general purpose SQL engine for the Hadoop world. So this should work for analytical as well as transaction workloads, meaning there are no assumptions that went into the architecture that says this can only be done, this can only be used for long running queries. Um, in other words, you should be able to run queries uh, from microseconds um, up to hours. Now, <clears throat> when you talk about running queries for hours, it doesn't have fault tolerance yet, so that might, and queries that run into uh, node failures will get aborted, but um, there's nothing that would stop you from running long queries in principle. Another goal was to run directly on top of Hadoop, so it reads the widely used Hadoop file formats, and um, at the moment I'll talk about the details in a second, and in particular we wanted to support the widely used Hadoop storage managers, so that meant at the moment HDFS and HBase. <coughs> And also, it is co-located with the nodes that run the Hadoop processes. So, uh, data nodes and region servers will also have an Impala process co-located with it that runs that part of the query that is responsible for the local data. Um, one <clears throat> comment in general: If you want to, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. Don't um, feel like you have to hold it off until the end of the talk. And another. Uh, minor detail was also we wanted it to be high performance. Um, so we used C++ instead of Java, and we're also utilizing runtime code generation to make query processing fast compared to traditional interpretive approaches, uh, for instance, that you will find in Postgres and the like. And it is a completely new execution engine that has nothing to do with MapReduce. So while it uses uh, the infrastructure that provides the data, it doesn't utilize any of the infrastructure that runs map reductions, such as job trackers or task trackers. What does a pilot look like from the user's perspective? Um, it is run as a distributed service, meaning there is one Impala daemon um, on each node that has data. User queries are submitted via an ODBC interface that runs internally through a um, Beeswax Thrift API. And you can talk to any of the demons. Any of the demons can act as a query coordinator and accept user-facing requests. So there's no such thing as just one point of entry for the system. <clears throat> Each query is distributed to all the nodes that have relevant data. In other words, it is paralyzed along similar lines of what a map reduction would do. At the moment, if any of the node fails, the entire query fails, the user will get the query failure back um, as an error message and can then retry the query. And uh, in order to integrate better with the existing infrastructure, we also decided that we were going to reuse Hive's metadata interface. So Hive internally has a um, <clears throat> metadata storage system called Metastore and Impala utilizes that so you can query if you have an existing Hive setup and have declared mapped HDFS files into Hive tables you will be able to query those tables if the file formats are supported via Impala. Um, supported file formats. Right now we only have in the beta version we only have text files and uh, sequence files in various compression formats, snappy and gzip. At the moment, um, we will soon have compressed text files as well, in particular LZO. You might even see that before the GA version comes up. We are also uh, working on Avro data files. <coughs> that has been something that's been requested a lot. And also for high performance, it's also very desirable to have a columnar format and uh, one format that has been proposed was Trevi, 
that was uh, has been developed by Doug Cutting, and that is something that we're also working on adopting and uh, making accessible in Impala. Now, I don't think Trevney doesn't have any support in Hive right now, so I doubt that people are using it actively at the moment, but uh, the goal is to make it possible to write Trevney files in Impala and, and read them back with a substantial performance gain over text or even sequence files. We wanted to make Impala a kind of a drop-in replacement for Hive, and so the SQL dialect that Impala supports is very much patterned after Hive SQL, if you're familiar with that. So it is somewhat limited compared to any of the major SQL standards. It does support select, projection, join, union, union all and union distinct, as well as uncorrelated subqueries, and aggregation of course, and insert. Order by at the moment is only supported with limits, so uh, that can be a, uh, a stumbling block, but you can get around that by simply using a very high limit, and then it should still work. And the beta version does not have any DDL support, so you cannot create tables in Impala at the moment or alter them, but we're hoping to have that by GA as well. And of course, a simple workaround is to use Hive to uh, do that for you. Compared to Hive, there are several functional limitations. Uh, for instance, there are no custom UDS at the moment. File formats are limited to what I already mentioned. There are, in particular, no CERTIs. So Hive uses these serialization, deserialization objects in order to make custom file formats accessible. And uh, Impala, because of its performance orientation, has chosen not to go that route. So there's no way to utilize existing Hive CERTIs. And there are probably no plans on doing that, adding support for that in the future. There's also nothing beyond standard SQL on scalar data types. So Hive also gives you the ability to buckets, and there's something like samples, transforms, and there are com more complex data structures like arrays and structs, and none of that is supported in Impala at the moment. Uh, again, this is, has been requested quite a lot, and there seems to be a lot of interest in particular in modeling um, complex data types, and so there will be support for that added in the future. Presumably not for GA, that's a bit more work than we're anticipating doing for that uh, launch date. In terms of joins, Impala can only do hash joins at the moment, and um, it's even more limited than, than that. The join table has to fit in memory. So the right-hand side of the join statement or of any list of tables in the front class has to fit in memory, and um, it doesn't even do repartitioning joins in the beta, so that means that the right-hand side table has to fit in the memory of every node that is involved in the query. This will, again, change so that uh, <clears throat> in the GA version, it will have to fit, it'll do, it'll repartition the right-hand side and the left-hand side, and you will only have to fit it into the aggregate memory of all nodes that are involved in the query. Beyond GA, there will also be um, disk-based versions of uh, hash join, and then presumably also uh, merge join. The beta is also uh, very rudimentary in terms of what it can do for planning. Right now, there's no join order optimization whatsoever. So the order you specify in the front clause is the order in which the joins get executed. Impala generates lefty plans, and so this is the equivalent of a fully hinted query plan, basically. That is, of course, assumes a lot, in particular, that the user knows how to pick the right join order and um, string the tables together so that it doesn't blow up memory, etc., which is not something you really want to think about every time you run a query. So there's, of course, plans for us to add a cost-based optimizer as well so that you could do, um, it will be doing cost-based join order optimization as well as cost-based repartitioning. <laughs> 
Meet face. Uh, like I said, one of the <laughs> supported. Ah, question. Good question. What's an ideal application for Impala? An ideal application for Impala. Should I rephrase? Should I repeat all the questions for the recording? Yeah, if you can repeat okay. those. So the question was, what is an ideal use case for Impala? And like I tried to say in the beginning, there isn't really any one particular ideal use case. The goal was to get a very broadly applicable SQL engine. So if you wanted to run it against HBase and your application fit within the functional limitations of it, you could use it for that to serve single row queries. That's a possible application. You can also use it to run very long running queries that take hours. That would take uh, tens of hours in Hive, that is also an ideal application, so to speak. So I would say wherever it fits into your functional, wherever the functional limitations fit your use case, that would be an ideal application. So there isn't really one. Like I said, at the moment it comes with a lot of functional limitations, and I will go through them. Um, these will be whittled down and removed over time. So the goal is really to have a very broadly usable and applicable query engine that you can throw at any kind of application you have. Um, speaking, of, uh, speaking of low latency applications, so HBase has been in much in demand. Part of the reason is that it's, you can use it for user-facing things. You can do individual row queries or inserts in milliseconds, presumably. And uh, so the goal was also to support HBase. And right now, it is very much tied to the way Hive supports HBase, which is um, every row key needs to be basically a string in order for you to turn where clause conditions into predicates on the row key into start and stop keys, which is what you would like to do. Otherwise, you end up with full table scans. Um, you can also do. Beyond Hive, it actually does transform predicates on other columns that are not mapped to the row key. Um, those get mapped into single column value filters in HBase. Um, other than that, all, um, all column families are expected to be strings and then are then mapped into scalar row types, uh, column types. So at the moment, you cannot have something like Avro or Thrift uh, structs that are sitting in the column families that would get them then get mapped into multiple columns in your Hive table or in your Impala table. So that's a limitation that will also be removed at some point in the future. So right now, HBase support works, uh, and like I said, if it fits your particular application, then by all means you should use it. But keep in mind there are some limitations on how you can map your data. Uh, one functional limitation is also that Impala at the moment does not do nested loop joins. So if you wanted to store, if you wanted to join a few tables, if you wanted to join a few tables from table A to a few tables from table B, you wouldn't be able to do that very well because it would like to, it would want to try to build up a hash table of table B before joining to table A. What you really want to do in this case is a nested loop join from A to B where you can do row key lookups and that is not supported at the moment and is also something that we're considering for future inclusion. <clears throat> so this was the user-facing part. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask. Uh, the Impala architecture. Impala right now is basically a single binary, Impala D, that runs on every single node that has data. And then there's also a a global system repository called State Store, which runs on a single node in the entire system. Uh, the Impala daemon does basically services both ends. On the one hand, it handles client requests. Um, on the other hand, it also handles all internal requests. So it acts both as a front end and as a back end. Both ends are being exported as thrift services. So there are two separate thread services, um, the Impala service and the Impala internal service. The state store right now is only used as a name service. So all Impala demons, when they start up, 
they need to know where the state store lives, and they register with the state store, and in turn, they get membership information, so they find out about all the other Empower Demons that are running in the system. This is how the Empower Demons find out where to, uh, across which nodes to spread a query. The state store is also, the service is also exported as a, as a thrift service. Query execution. Um, as I mentioned before, requests arrive via the ODBC interface, which gets, or there's an ODBC driver, which in turn talks to the Beeswax Thrift API. The ODBC driver can target any of the Impala demons in the system, and in particular, it could round robin across all of them to spread the load. Um, on each Impala daemon, the, you have the user-facing side, which uh, as a first instance runs a planner to take the request and turn it into a collection of planned fragments. <coughs> the planner then hands off the planned fragments to the coordinator, which then serves as the single instance that coordinates the entire plan execution across all of the Impala Ds that are involved in this query. The coordinator determines which Impala Ds to talk to based on the membership information that it received from the state store, <coughs> as well as any um, the location information for the blocks that it received from the name node, assuming you're querying something that sits on HDFS, and then also applies any predicates uh, that it got from the query in order to prune down the set of files and blocks it needs to run against. During execution, so unlike MapReduce, where each phase of execution needs to materialize its output, which is then picked up by the subsequent phase, um, and which serves as the input for the subsequent phase, in Impala, all Impala Ds uh, talk to each other in a streaming fashion. So that if you don't have any blocking operators in the query, such as aggregation or a, an order by, uh, you will get results instantly. If you're just doing a bunch of joins, you would be able to get something back very quickly. The planner, like I mentioned before, join order right now is from clause order. The operators that the planner deals with are um, a scan. So the, the planner takes that back. The planner constructs a lefty tree of these operators. Each operator either materializes data or it combines data in some way. Some operators are blocking. So the scan, there are specialized scan nodes for all the different um, storage managers. So we have an HDFS scan node right now, an HBase scan node, which uh, internally also employ different process for the different file formats. There are, there's a hash join, which combines data. There's hash aggregation, which builds up a hash table and then outputs the aggregate result, there is a union operator, which basically merges the output from different plan fragments. There is a top n operator, which does the equivalent of ordered by with a limit. And there is an exchange operator, which handles the data exchange between two plan fragments running on two different nodes. Any questions? Um, aggregation. Aggregation is distributed in a relatively simple fashion. The, um, any of the nodes that has data right now is basically pre-aggregating as much as possible and there is a merge step happening. So a final aggregation step is happening at the coordinator. Um, we will extend that to do hash partition aggregation as well so that if the aggregation result is very large, you could still end up sending very many rows to the final aggregation step. If you're doing hash, pay, hash partition aggregation, you would have a repartitioning step after the initial partitioning step that then needs to deal with a lot less data, and so you have additional speed up there. Um, all plans right now are partitions uh, along scan boundaries. So what happens is there's a first planning phase which produces a single node plan. This is the lefty plan. 
that I talked about earlier, and then um, the plan is broken up along scan lines. So, <clears throat> so that each scan is, is uh, run locally on the nodes that hold the data, and based on that is then, the result of that is then sent to nodes that require the data. So that could mean that if you're joining a, an HBase table with an HDFS table, that the HBase scan then redistributes the data to the nodes running the HBase, uh, the HDFS scan, and doing the join. That sounds a little, if that sounds a little abstract, I'll go into an example. <clears throat> Here's a query that does a simple um, HDFS scan and HBase scan, joins the two, and then computes an aggregation with a grouping operation. The first planning phase would produce the um, would produce the local plan, which does exactly that: just the two scans, joins, followed by aggregation, followed by top n for the order by limit. That is then broken up along scan lines. Uh, what happens here is that each scan is executed in a separate plan in a separate plan fragment. So the H base scan goes into this fragment, the HDFS scan goes into this fragment. Um, you want to keep joins, etc., as close to the <coughs> scans that produce the actual data, so that in this case, the join is executed in combination with the HDFS scan, and the HBase scan's data is broadcast to all of these planned fragments. So here's an exchange node that receives the data. This hash join node will then build up an in-memory hash table and perform the join, followed by a pre-aggregation step. The output of that pre-aggregation step is then sent to the final plan fragment, of which there's only one instance. That is run at the coordinator. There's also an exchange node that receives the data. The data is then aggregated in another in-memory hash table. And the output of that is run through a top-end operation. And that produces the final result. Yes. So when I point the part of the HDFS storage layer, the HDFS has an application when it runs three times to have the application of the data? No, no, it will it will talk to the main node. And so let me rephrase the question. Um, <clears throat> if you're running something against an HDFS against HDFS data and there's you have a three-way replication factor in HDFS, does it mean that the query and in particular, the results run three times. And no, that is not the case. Impala will talk to the name node. It will find out each of the replicas for each block that HDFS holds. But it will only pick one of the replicas to run the query. And it will round robin among them. So that's what happens. How about this operator that you mentioned? Can I add my own operators? The frame operators, the aggregation one and the um, no, <laughs> to uh, short answer. So the question was, <clears throat> given that this is a somewhat modular architecture, can you add your own operators easily? The answer is no. I mean, it's an open source project, so you can just take the sources and actually modify them to your heart's content. So in principle, yes. But there is no particularly simple exposed API <coughs> in order to be adding additional <coughs> plant operators. Why not? Well, what are some considerations? I mean, there's, there is an internal API, and like I said, you can just write code and, and add it. That's entirely possible. But it's not like a, let's say, like high 30s architecture, where you have a relatively simple and well-defined external interface. So that doesn't exist. It's well-defined. It's not really relatively simple. And so uh, that hasn't really been foreseen. Here's an example of how a query would run through the system. In this example, we're assuming we have um, three nodes. The SQL application submits a query via ODBC, and it goes to any one of the nodes, um, and it interacts with the query plan. The 
the planner turns the request into a collection of planned fragments and then hands that off to the query coordinator, which then in turn talks to the query executors at each of the nodes that hold data that is relevant for the query. <coughs> at this point, so all of the all of the executors will start running in parallel. The executors then initiate uh, scans and the other query operators. If we go back to the previous example, there was one HDFS scan and one HBase scan. In this example, we're assuming that there's exactly one node doing the HBase scan and two nodes doing the HDFS scans. And this is basically what would happen. The query executor doing the HBase scan would then broadcast the data to the query executors doing the HDFS scans as dictated by the connection of the planned fragments. Those would in turn do the joins and send the pre-aggregation and send the results back to the initiating query coordinator. Now, if they didn't do uh, any kind of aggregation in between, all of this would be streaming. So there would be data flowing at all times and the initial record that would be coming out of this and going back to the coordinator and, and turn back to the user would actually be produced very quickly. Metadata. Let's go back to this. <clears throat> um, this diagram is also shown in the Hive Meta Store and the HDFS name node as quasi components of the system. Those obviously also hold those hold the metadata that are important in order to run an Impala query. Hive, the Hive Meta Store contains the mapping of the physical data into the logical tables that are exposed, and the HDFS name node contains the, um, the details of the distribution of the files across nodes and uh, even contains information about what, what uh, disk volumes they sit on on the individual nodes. Impala itself, uh, besides using <laughs> Hive Metastore, also caches metadata. So unlike Hive, if you've worked with Hive, you might know that for each query, it actually uh, interrogates Metastore and basically um, does the full requests all the metadata for all the tables that are named in the query. Impala doesn't do that because that would introduce too much latency. So it caches metadata to avoid all synchronous Metastore API calls. They, um, Impala Ds read the metadata at startup at the moment, which can be a problem if uh, you have a lot of nodes starting up at the same time. So we're of course working on removing that limitation and also using the state store to distribute uh, the metadata itself. So that uh, that would act as a cache of metadata and would be better be able to serve metadata to uh, Impala Ds at startup. The execution engine itself is written in C++. <coughs> so while <coughs> part of Impala, in particular the planner, the whole front end, the processing, semantic analysis, and the planner are written in Java, which facilitated interacting with the rest of the Hadoop environment. For instance, the Metastore API is a Java, has a Java client library, as well as the name node API. Uh, for the execution engine, we wanted to part with that and write it in C++. Uh, one particular wrinkle is that we're using runtime code generation in order to transform all big loops um, over batches of data into something that the CPU can execute efficiently. So uh, in particular, if you're familiar with the internals of typical relational database systems, such as Postgres, for instance, you will see a lot of interpretive code in there. So there's a lot of interpretation going on in terms of evaluating expressions or um, getting data out of various um, indices, etc. In Impala, we try to avoid that as much as possible, and we're using a piece of infrastructure called LLVM in order to accomplish that. The idea is that if you have an expression where A equals B, or where A plus B equals C, in your query, you don't want to have to run, you don't want to make three function calls to evaluate that. You would ideally simply use the um, 
the operations that the CPU provides you in order to evaluate that. And this is what Impala is achieving with LLVM. So with LLVM, expressions uh, are baked into something that is basically one big loop and that is then run directly. So we try to get rid of function calls as much as possible and, um, and thereby gain a lot of speed. In order to run over um, user-supplied data formats, unlike relational data systems which have a baked-in format and you have to load your data into the system, which can then utilize at runtime an optimized binary format, that is not really a, um, a viable solution in Hadoop due to the different file formats that are being utilized. Impala gets around that to some extent by copying all data into a canonical in-memory format so that uh, data is only parsed once. For instance, if you're interacting with text data, you will have to parse it, obviously, but that's only done once. And uh, after that transformation, data is handled in that in-memory format um, till the very end. Impala also uses intrinsics, so meaning special CPU instructions, in order to do some of the heavy lifting, for instance, text processing, Intel has some nifty uh, special instructions for that. There's also, for instance, for hash value computation, you can use a special CRC32 instruction, which is a lot faster still than even optimized libraries. <clears throat> the Impala state store, like I said before, uh, the state store is a system state repository that right now is used as a name service. So it provides membership information to all running Impala demons. Uh, right now, metadata is not stored in it, but that is a goal for the future, so that metadata would be distributed through uh, the state store as well. And we're also planning on using that for generally in interesting system information. So anything such as load or diagnostics that could be used to improve the functioning of the cluster we're planning on distributing through the state store. The state store is soft state. It is a, uh, there's only a single instance of it. And in order for it not to be a single point of failure, it needs to be soft state. So none of the state handled by the state store is something that only the state store has. The state store generates that from um, all Impala Ds that are registered with it at runtime. And when the state store fails, uh, the Impala Ds notice that and wait for it to come back up and then re-register with the state store. Um, likewise, it, that works the other way around too. So the state store continuously communicates with the Impala Ds and uh, which basically gives you a heartbeat mechanism which allows it to detect um, Impala D failures as well. And the state store also has a Thrift API um, for the service registration as well as subscription registration that we're also planning on use, using more extensively also for monitoring tools. I have a question. Yes. Uh, is there any reason why there's uh, so many references for Thrift API as opposed to using the uh, Avro RPC? Uh, it was a matter of maturity. By the, at the time we started this project, we didn't feel like the Avro RPC, in particular the C++ infrastructure, was mature enough to use it, and Thrift was at that point. So we just, it was just pragmatic. So there was no, there's no particular reason for that. Yes? Um, so does this state store kind of take over the functionality of the state? Zookeeper and any other functions? Yeah, in a sense, yes. Um, there are some particular communication patterns in here that would ne necessitate end by end communication that we didn't feel Zookeeper was really predestined for. So this gets around it by actually going through things one by one. And then as the cluster gets bigger, it simply reduces the frequency of heartbeats. But we felt that if we did it with Zookeeper, it would result in end by end communication, and then it would give you, it would be a scalability limit. It's 
So there's been a lot of uh, talk about Dremel in the past years since the publication, I guess, 2010. And uh, <clears throat> in particular, Impala has also been, has also been compared to Dremel. And uh, in order to get a really meaningful assessment of what that means, you have to take a step back and look at what Dremel actually provides. Dremel is two things. One is uh, Dremel provides columnar storage for nested structures. So at Google, everything is stored in protocol buffers, and protocol buffers naturally give you nesting. And so the goal had been to provide that same kind of nesting and uh, be able to run SQL over it. So Dremel was designed as a columnar storage manager, so they had to come up with a columnar storage format for nested data. That is column I.O. Dremel also provides then a distributed aggregation engine on top of that, at least in the version as was published in the 2010 paper. The way they accomplish that is what, basically the same way that traditional parallel database systems do scalable aggregation. And so it was very much in that same vein. So taking Dremel and comparing it to Impala, Impala is only part of the story. Impala does not try to uh, provide a new storage manager. The goal was explicitly to reuse existing storage managers. So Impala did not make any attempt at inventing a new storage manager or adding new file formats. File formats should be um, outside of the processing framework. And so that's why we chose Trevni as the right vehicle to deliver basically a columnar format. So in other words, if you utilize Impala with Trevni, you would get a similar system as Dremel provides you, except compared to the Dremel system as published in the 2010 paper, Impala can already do joins. So I would say Impala plus Trevni is already beyond what Dremel did uh, as of 2010. Now looking at the other SQL engine that you find in Hadoop, Hive, how does Impala compare to Hive? So Hive uses MapReduce as the execution engine, which comes with some built-in advantages, such as uh, fault tolerance, but also comes with some very severe disadvantages, such as uh, high latency. Uh, everything started up through MapReduce takes, I don't know how many seconds in order just to run a single job. You have to thread through the job tracker. Um, all output is materialized on disk before it can be used for anything. So Hive naturally adds a lot more overhead, not just in terms of total latency, but also adds a lot more I.O. Um, load onto your system. In, uh, Hive was also written with a Java runtime system that is very flexible, has a lot of internal layers that um, allow <coughs> extensibility, which uh, we felt came at the disadvantage of uh, performance. So Hive tends to be very slow and tends to get CPU bound very quickly. So Impala is a, is a, direct, is a direct opposite in, in each way that you can imagine. Like I said, there are no 30s. Right now, there are no UDFs. We're planning on supporting UDFs, though. That is one of the most heavily requested features, and uh, it is it very much tried to reduce or remove any of the internal layers that you uh, find when you're running Korean Hive. Speaking of performance, there are no specific numbers I can quote. This entirely depends on the advantage you will see over Hive, entirely depends on your system and your workload. Um, in Hive, it's very easy to get CPU bound so that you may not be approaching the maximum capacity that your I.O. subsystem will give you. With Impala, you can usually get full disk throughput. And um, so you cannot go beyond full disk throughput. So there's a natural limit to the uh, speed up you can get if you're running in a disk-based system. But we've often seen performance improvements uh, by a factor of three or four or more, 10. If you're running queries against in-memory data, things look very different because then you're not bound 
by, you know, limited by the speed of your disks. And we have sometimes seen speed ups of a factor of 100 even. So again, there are no hard numbers. It depends entirely on what you're doing and what your cluster looks like. Have you done any comparisons with Shard, which no. is high volume of Spark? Right, yes. Because it yeah. tends to have a very similar type of architecture in trying to keep as much of the intermediate data in memory as possible. <laughs> it seems to be a lot of the, you know, the performance improvement compared to just the C++. Uh, so the question was, have you compared this to Shark, which is um, Hive over Spark? Spark is a uh, a research project at UC Berkeley? And the answer is no, we haven't done any performance comparison against Shark. It's, I can't compare it in detail. I don't know enough about the details of Spark itself. Uh, you would still be running Hive, and um, Hive comes with a lot of performance penalties built in, simply because of the runtime system. So I would still expect it to be faster. But, the numbers seem kind of similar to what uh, Shark Talk is. Could be. Like I said, I can't, I can't quote any specifics. Uh, Impala right now is in beta, as of, has been for a little over a month. Um, has been developed for about a year and a half. And um, as any beta version comes with a number of functional restrictions, <laughs> but uh, we're hoping to have a GA version by end of March. And we uh, encourage anyone to try it out and send us comments and in particular bug reports so we can make the GA version better. If you have comments, questions, feel free to ask now. So there's a lot of reference for the Hive Metastore. Uh, are there any specific reasons why you guys chose not to go with the H catalog, other than the fact that about the time you started, I'm guessing H catalog wasn't really there? So the question was, why not, why Metastore, why not H catalog? The answer is, you already answered it yourself, uh, H catalog didn't exist at the time we started, and so we didn't really want to wait for something to come around. So we just chose something that seemed like the most plausible candidate, and we didn't want to invent our own metadata storage solution. So this was purely pragmatic, and we will, in the future, take into account whatever the most popular metadata repository is. The goal is, of course, to make it work better in a, Hadoop, a typical Hadoop environment, so we'll be following the trend. Yes? So the, yes, you. Uh, sorry, I'm one um, the, So why the metadata at all? I mean, if I understand right, the purpose of this is primarily for distributed tables, right? And many of the formats you support uh, have internal uh, data structures, right? Uh, the, the necessary information out of it. Sorry, I didn't. So I didn't know it was going in, in most cases, you could write a SQL uh, against these files that would uh, look for a key in the file because uh, that structure is already coded in the file. Say so you're using an Azure file, you're using page base, right? You know what the keys are when you're reading the data. Um, is there a reason why you went with the meta store to record what that structure is rather than just leaving it open? Sure. <coughs> the question was, there are some file formats that actually encode the metadata of their contents, such as the Avro data file, or uh, you mentioned HBase. So, <clears throat> so uh, just a comment on that. So HBase itself actually doesn't really store metadata. HBase, right now, the way the mapping works is, like I said, you're required to store strings in there, and then they are mapped onto the particular data types that you're interested in. Uh, every data files do contain their own format. However, there are lots of other file formats out there, such as text sequence file, that people are interested in and use very heavily. And I would say they're even the majority. Avro seems to be getting, seeing more interest generated now, or 
as of late, but I would definitely say sequence file is probably still the predominant format, and those do not contain metadata information. So, and the, the metadata, the purpose of metadata is to give you, to provide semantics for the data that you're querying, right? If something is an integer, that is, a, that is relevant to you because you can do operations on it that you can't really do on a string. So you want to declare your logical table. So that is basically the purpose of the metadata that is stored behind. And uh, there isn't really a way to get around that. So even with Avro, you will still need a pre-declared table format that says this is an integer column. If you then map a file into it that does not conform to that format, you can return an error. But you can't just rely on the file to provide you all of the metadata. Yes? I'm curious about multi-tenancy, because it seems like uh, if every single compute node can start executing a query and sending Yes. You know, sub queries off to each of the other nodes, you can quickly exhaust your resources. Yes, you could. So uh, the question was uh, about multi-tenancy, and the underlying question is really about resource management. What happens when you're running uh, multiple queries at the same time? You have processes that are co-located with data nodes, etc., with other Java processes. They consume system resources, and yes, that is correct. That is not as a, a good question. It is not handled right now in the beta. And the goal is to, um, without giving too much detail, because there isn't really that much detail to give, is to make it so that you can have, across the entire cluster, quotas to which you can assign the queries that are running. And that will then naturally limit what resources they can access. So that you would be able to run experimental queries in a production cluster and keep it from A, blowing up your cluster, and B, slowing down your production, either queries or even map reductions. So this is really the ideal scenario, and uh, we don't have that yet, and that's definitely on the roadmap. How does the client, how does the client know where, or which node send a query to? The client could also interrogate the state store, because it has all the information. Um, we'll likely build that into a client library. So it doesn't exist right now. Right now you have to point the ODBC driver to a particular node. But you could imagine putting a load balance in front of it that would then simply round robin between uh, Impala demons. Are there any security concerns with uh, access to that Impala daemon? Uh, there are. I mean, it's also... We have a Kerberized version, so you can run it in a Kerberos environment and get authentication that way. Yes. Can you flip back into performance in uh, the, the, the previous slides? Oh. I just you know, want to understand the, uh, the last one that I cannot capture. So, so uh, for in memory data, about 100x over right? I'm, I'm saying we have seen, we have observed up to, like I said, the specifics depend very much on your workload, etc. So, so, so essentially, I was, you know, to summarize this page, if the workload has small queries and that's not uh, desired or bound, that's the more suitable way to hire that. I mean, so the question was specifically about small queries. And small queries in general incur a very high overhead in Hive because of the MapReduce startup cost. And so Impala has a natural advantage uh, over Hive there because the startup cost is negligible. So even on disk-based small queries, you can see very big speedups. Yes? Does uh, Impala require the, the cloud error distribution or does it run on other Impala requires CDH 4.1, yes, and even it requires a specific uh, cloud error distribution. Simply because there were the, there were some performance enhancements that that are in upstream, that are in trunk, but uh, I'm not sure what where where you would get that from in a packaged Hadoop version. So that's why. Yes. 
UDF support, yes. The question is, is UDF support on the roadmap? Yes, it is very much on the roadmap. That is probably one of the most requested items along with Avro data files. So this will be post-GA, though. Um, the, the goal will be to do something that does not incur the traditional per-call you know, UDF overhead. So we'll have to do something. We'll have to think of something smarter than that. Yes, actually. Do you have plans to not set, not require CDH burden? Not at the moment. Small team, too much work. Yes, you asked that question. I'm going to do fast. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm glad I can help. Yes. Is there any plan to um, make connections to existing BI tools? Existing BI tools such as Entaho, Tableau? MicroStrategy. Yeah, in fact, we are integrated with existing BI tools, the, mainly through the ODC driver. But yes, we do support and have shown demos at Hadoop World of uh, Tableau, MicroStrategy, Pentar, or Chromosphere running over in Cloud. Cliffview, Cliffview, also. So, yes. You want this better version? Excuse me? Even with beta version? With which version? Yes. Oh, the beta version. Yes, yes. Even with the beta version. Yes. I'm curious for your HDFS access. Since you are in C, are you using libHDFS, webHDFS? What? Sure. The question is how do we access HDFS from C? We are using libHDFS. That is correct. You actually have a JVM running in the background. Yeah, yeah, there's JVM running. And uh, libhdfs or hdfs, the hdfs client, fortunately has a has the uh, direct mode, so it's actually pretty fast. You're getting, we're seeing basically we're getting raw disk speeds in essence. All right. If there are any more questions, feel free to ask me after this event. Thank you.